Well, good evening, everybody. That's good. It's one of these rare environments where I don't have to raise the microphone. I'm by far the shortest speaker here this evening. Welcome to A Taste of Reformation here at Ambrose University. Uh, it's a pleasure to be able to uh, host tonight. My name is Brent Trask, and I work with the Christian Missionary Alliance churches in Alberta and one church in the Northwest Territories in Yellowknife. Uh, and uh, tonight is actually, uh, as far as the Alliance Churches of Alberta go, uh, it's a kickoff event to get our hearts and minds moving towards this occasion that we call District Conference. And so a little trivia on the Alliance Church is that every two years, uh, delegates come together from leadership across our Alliance Churches in our region, and we come together to talk about our future and our past and where we're headed. And that's coming up in the month of May. Uh, a while back, actually over a year ago, as I was thinking ahead to district conference this coming May, uh, it struck me that this was going to be the 500th anniversary of Martin Luther having written his 95 points of protest and gone and nailed them to the door of the Wittenberg Castle Church uh, where he was pastoring. And uh, the significance of that event and how might that actually be an on-ramp to start thinking for our district conference. And so we've called our district conference Reformation, Reformation. And the question is, how do I need to reform my life or my church to be more faithfully and fruitfully on mission with Jesus? What intrigues me is the stunning courage, the boldness at great self-sacrifice of women and men who have gone on before us some 500 years ago, but actually dating back really before that, as you'll hear about more tonight, uh, but dating back um, uh, at least 500 years ago, uh, people who stood out for recalibration in the church, a significant shift in the church on theolo theological matters, behavioral matters, and practices within the church. And today we stand on the shoulders of many of those that had the bold courage to step out. One of my questions is, in what way might we be in a generation that is going to be required to make such bold, courageous choices ourselves, both in ideology, theology, uh, perhaps in uh, behavior and practices at the local church level. So we hope to get to that in our Q&A time tonight. Uh, I'm also intrigued on the whole subject of the uh, Reformation because I've had the privilege of being on two Reformation history tours. And both of them were extremely stimulating to me. Uh, one of them was with the two presenters that we have uh, here this evening. And so they've become uh, great friends, uh, partly because we got to travel together in Europe and think on these things. Our two presenters tonight are Bernie Vanderwall and Kyle Jansen. Uh, both Bernie and Kyle come with uh, academic prowess background uh, in this subject field. Um, uh, Bernie is um, a professor of uh, theology and has focused his PhD work on Reformation theology. Uh, he has taught on this subject, he has led tours on this subject, uh, deeply interested in this subject area. And Kyle Jansen is professor of history uh, here at Ambrose and has studied um, much about Reformation history. Uh, both of these men are authors and we have some of their books here for sale tonight and I'll just talk about that in a moment. Uh, as well, uh, both of these gentlemen have been professors here at Ambrose University since 1999. So that in and of itself almost takes them back to the days of the historic Martin Luther. Uh, we're thrilled tonight with the, uh, with the response of some 35-ish that we have here in the room tonight. We also have about 35 joining us live on Ambrose's U, uh, YouTube channel. And so we welcome those of you that are here virtually. Uh, the format that we have for this evening is two 40-minute presentations. The first presentation will be Ki by Kyle Jansen. Uh, Kyle is going to talk about contextual factors. Uh, what was going on in the history of the world at this time, in the history of the church, and uh, what, what was really the, uh, uh, the groundwork of the conditions in which the Reformation spawned. And then after that, um, Bernie Vanderwall will come and he'll have 40 minutes to talk on uh, Reformation theology. What were the new ideas, the bold ideas that were brought uh, to the floor and what uh, impact did this have uh, on the church? Uh, throughout that time I encourage you to write down questions because we will end with a 30-minute 
uh, question and answer time. I have some of my own questions. I'm going to moderate that time, and we're going to come and sit at the front. Uh, we'll receive your questions. If you're online, there should be a chat window somewhere for you to write your questions, so you can just write them while you're thinking of them, and uh, we'll try and collect those and respond to some of those questions at the conclusion of our time. For those of you that are here with me in the room, you'll see there's a large book table over here with a variety of books uh, that, that are of interest, either uh, uh, directly on this subject matter or have been written by um, uh, Ambrose professors, including uh, books that are authored by these uh, two gentlemen. Uh, one other announcement is, oh, is right at the end, we'll also have about five minutes just to chat about Reformation tours and upcoming uh, fuller courses. This is a two-hour uh, uh, evening session, uh, but other course offerings are going to be here at Ambrose uh, in the months to come, and that's where we will conclude our evening. So I just welcome you here. Let's pray together, and then I will turn it over to Kyle. Well, Lord Jesus, we are uh, full of anticipation at the taste of Reformation tonight. And we invite you, Holy Spirit, to come instruct us through um, history, instruct us through revolt, uh, instruct us, Lord, through the things that have been and the things that we've stepped into that maybe we don't realize uh, how the church operates and what we believe together today and how that stems back to some reformers. We pray tonight, Lord, that this would be more than academic, that uh, truly we would see and hear from you, uh, and that this would spur us on to greater deeds and good faith, or good deeds and faith uh, going forward. Instruct us, Lord, how we may need to reform our lives and our churches in this present day to be more fully and fruitfully on mission with you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, good evening. As we celebrate the 500th anniversary of the beginning of the Protestant Reformation, it is fitting that we look back on that event, both to understand something of what happened back in 1517 and to reflect on what it might mean for Christians and churches today. That is the purpose of tonight's lectures and discussion. And in that spirit, I'd like to begin with some background uh, a few thoughts on the historical context uh, in which the Reformation took place. And after that, I'll try to describe some of the various late medieval grievances expressed by Luther and others that evolved into a fundamental ecclesiastical break with the Church of Rome. And finally, I'd like to identify a couple of key themes in this early Reformation phase, particularly the issue of authority and uh, hopefully that will set things up well for Bernie and his discussion of theology. Well, in the person of Martin Luther, we have ourselves a neat and tidy beginning to the Reformation. Many of you will know the date, October 31st, 1517, when Luther posted his 95 theses on the Wittenberg Castle Church door, so it is said, as an invitation to scholarly debate about papal indulgences. In reality, we know that revolutions, and the Reformation surely was a revolution, they don't start quite that abruptly. There's always some context to look at. So by way of background, I'd like to begin by making the point that the Reformation unfolded in a time and place very different from our own. It was an unfair, autocratic, and hierarchical age, often intolerant, prejudice-filled, Violent as well. It was a time when Jews, peasants, women, and foreigners were disdained, dishonored, and discriminated against. And we see in the Reformation, as the noted scholar Stephen Osmond once wrote, an age more primitive than our modern world, a society in which order and security held priority over equality and fairness. The pre-modern world was also spiritual and superstitious to an extent that would surprise us. People understood the struggle with sin and the devil and death to be as basic as the struggle for bread and land and political representation. Simply put, the spiritual realm was alive and important. Kings consulted horoscopes, 
The masses made pilgrimages to holy sites and holy relics. And people believed that God interacted directly with and through the natural world, blessing, warning, and punishing in ways that even the most devout today rarely do. To give you just one example, let me tell you about some bearded grapes. In 1560, some bearded grapes were found growing in a vineyard near a monastery in Prague. Part of the strange beard on the grapes was yellow-gray. Part of it was red and thick. Strange, yes, but not to worry. The local monks knew just what this aberration of nature meant. The red-bearded grapes were obviously a sign of God's wrath on account of rampant alcoholism. And that was marked by the yellow-gray grapes, the yellow-gray beard, which looked like the beard of an old degenerate drunk. So the monks publicized their findings and called for penance in order to avert the coming judgment. That might seem strange. It should, I think, and maybe a bit humorous. But if you know something of Martin Luther's story, you might be thinking of his 1505 crisis, where, as a young law student caught in a lightning storm, he panicked and cried out, Help me, Saint Anne, I'll become a monk. Because he thought that appealing to Saint Anne would be his best hope for surviving the storm. And this testifies to the kind of direct encounters that late medieval Europeans believed they had with with God, the devil, saints, spirits, demons, all of whom uh, interacted very directly with humans and were always active in nature. The Reformation also unfolded in a very different place. Looking at a map of 16th century Europe, kingdoms like France and England and Spain look much like their modern counterparts. But Central Europe is simply a cartographic dog's breakfast. The Holy Roman Empire, which you see here, and which, as the joke ran, was neither holy, nor Roman, nor an empire, must have been one of the most complex political entities ever invented. It was a multi-ethnic, multi-state, feudal empire in which the seven leading princes elected the emperor for life. Somewhat larger in size than than Alberta, the Holy Roman Empire contained over 300 territories, ruled by electors, dukes, margraves, bishops, abbots, counts, city councils, and imperial knights, all of whom owed their allegiance to the emperor as their lord, but who were basically independent within their own territories. A close-up of the 450 kilometers of territory between Wittenberg, where Luther lived, and Worms, where he had to go in 1521 to defend his uh, theology, um, shows just a myriad of states. Two Saxonies, Brandenburg, Magdeburg, Hesse, Nassau, and many, many others. And over the course of the 1400s, some of the larger of these territories began to aggressively consolidate, centralize, and expand their territory, swallowing up smaller states and stripping away the traditional rights of peasants and town people. And so you find in these days, peasants were often complaining of the loss of their common woods and common streams and common fields where they would gather wood, hunt, fish, and graze their livestock. Townspeople had their own sets of complaints. So as a result, in the late medieval era, there was a wide array of grievance literature that emerged, many, many protests. And one of the best known of these was called The Reformation of the Emperor Sigismund, which was printed anonymously in South Germany in the early 1400s. Let me read to you from the opening section of The Reformation of the Emperor Sigismund. Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth, lend your strength and grace to our endeavor. Grant us the wisdom to know and accomplish a true ordering of our spiritual and secular state, so that your sacred name and divinity will again be professed everywhere. Your anger is upon us. Your wrath has seized us. We are as sheep without a shepherd. 
Without asking your leave, we have strayed into the pasture. Obedience is dead. Justice is grievously abused. Nothing stands in its proper order. Therefore, God has withdrawn his grace from us. We ignore his commandments. What he has ordered, we do only if it pleases us. We practice obedience without righteousness. But we ought to realize matters cannot continue like this. We must undertake a proper ordering of our spiritual and secular affairs. Well, these crises that this document alludes to provoked passionate responses. In the early 1500s, there were a whole series of peasant rebellions in Germany. And between 1524 and 25, in the early years of the Reformation, probably around 200,000 people were killed in the peasant wars. Uh, similarly, around the same time in 1523, the 2,000 imperial knights who were still in existence in the Holy Roman Empire, they were impoverished, they were politically marginalized, and they too rose up in revolt unsuccessfully as well. Now within the Roman church, which was the Christian church in medieval Europe, there were also frustrations and protests against the growing worldliness of the papacy and of the higher clergy. And the, as well as the, uh, in, the institutionalism of a thousand years of administrative practice. And most histories of the Reformation point to a whole series of events and issues that form the backdrop or context. And I just want to briefly mention these. First of all would be the general state of worldliness and dysfunction in the papacy as seen in the Babylonian captivity when the papacy was carried off to Avignon, France. The Great Schism, which was rivalry between two claimants to the papal throne from different uh, regions. And the sorry spiritual and moral state of the Renaissance papacy, which often seemed more interested in building Rome or ruling Italy than caring for the Christian church. Along with that was the development of a complex papal bureaucracy and avaricious tax system which collected money from the faithful by means of a series of in, uh, instruments. The spolia, which was a tax on, on clerical land. Uh, the annates, the income from church offices. Dispensations, which were fees for evading church law. Or reservations, fees paid in advance in anticipation of an appointment. Then there were heresies like the Valdensians and Albigensians, whose interest in the scripture and in the spirit meant that they tended to shun the institutional church and criticize its rituals and traditions. And even within the fold of the church, the new, the new uh, monastic orders like the Franciscans, who advocated simplicity and humility and service to the poor, were an implicit critique of the worldliness and the luxury of the papacy. Then there was the conciliar movement, the attempt to reform the church through a series of church councils where bishops and archbishops would gather together to exercise authority. Then the emergence of John Wycliffe and the Lollard movement with uh, their appeal to scripture as an, as an authority in the church, rejecting various Roman teachings, including the doctrine of transubstantiation. Jan Hus, the, the, uh, the reformer from Bohemia, who followed Wycliffe's teaching and denounced the moral failings of the clergy and, and championed the place of lay people in the church. His challenge to papal authority led to his excommunication and his burning at the stake at the Council of Constance in 1415, about a century before Luther's Reformation. Then there was also the rise of universities and publishing. Both Wycliffe and Huss were university professors, part of a growing educational movement. There were many new universities founded between 13 and 1500 in Europe. And printing along with that from uh, Gutenberg's print shop that uh, opened around 1450 to 1500. In that span of time, there were over 60 uh, printing presses that were founded in Germany and over 200 across Europe. And these presses were a significant factor in the success of the, Re of the Reformation. Between 15, 
17 and 1550, Protestant authors churned out 10,000 titles and millions of copies of these spread all around the Holy Roman Empire and even wider in Europe. Thus the saying, no books, no reformation. Then there was the Brethren of the Common Life, another reform movement, kind of like a, a, a monastery for lay people, monastery light, you might say, centered on the, the Devotio Moderna, this modern devotion which emphasized personal relationship with, with Christ and, uh, and education. And the Brethren founded many schools, educated scholars like Erasmus of Rotterdam or Thomas of Kempis, if you've ever read The Imitation of Christ. He was educated in the Brethren School, and even Luther was as well. And then we have the emergence of Renaissance humanism, that intellectual movement which revived classical Roman and Greek learning and championed education. In Northern Europe, humanists published manuscripts of the Church Fathers and developed critical editions of the Bible in its original languages. Scholars like Erasmus of Rotterdam, Thomas Moore of England, and many others emphasized the authority of these ancient texts and criticized what they believed were useless rituals and ceremonies and teachings not established in Scripture. The moral and educational improvement of the clergy and the cultivation of simple piety were at the heart of this humanist reform movement, which eagerly supported Luther in his early days. Within a couple of weeks, humanists had spread copies of the 95 Theses all around the Holy Roman Empire. And as it was said in those days, Erasmus laid the egg that Luther hatched. And so we come to Martin Luther himself. The son of a prosperous miner, Luther was well-educated, studying liberal arts and law at the University of Erfurt at the beginning of the 1500s. His disenchantment with law and his interest in religion were cemented by that famous lightning storm and vow to become a monk, which he did. He was, in fact, a strict monk. He lived the ascetic life and rose quickly in monastic ranks. Ordained a priest in 1507, by 1508 he was teaching philosophy at the University of Wittenberg. By 1512 he was a theology professor. By 1514 he had become a preacher in the local convent and in the Wittenberg town church. And by 1515 he was supervising 11 monastic houses. Now the fame Luther would soon achieve was the result of his opposition to the sale of indulgences. This was the ecclesiastical abuse that most troubled uh, pious 16th century Christians. Indulgences were documents issued by the church declaring that the person to whom they had been made was released from the penalties of his or her sin. Now, these might be penalties of contrition, acts of contrition uh, uh, performed as part of confession. Or in the case of plenary indulgences, they might be the penalties to be performed in purgatory, where Christian souls would go after death to endure a painful purification in preparation for heaven, sometimes for tens of thousands of years. During the Crusades, these indulgences had been granted to crusaders who died or fought valiantly. But indulgences could also be earned through pilgrimages and by the 16th century by donating money to the church. And it was this that had deteriorated to the point where indulgences were, were essentially being sold and the underlying idea that one had to have asked for forgiveness, to have exercised faith, forgotten or ignored altogether. So Luther's 95 Theses, posted on October 31st, 1517, were his response to this indulgence controversy. In them, he argued that repentance was the key to forgiveness, that God was the one who granted forgiveness, that popes did not have authority over what happened after death. And he was very critical of charging money for indulgences, arguing instead that donations should be given to care for the poor instead. Over time, Luther and the other reformers rejected the Roman Catholic doctrine of purg purgatory as cynical and unbiblical and condemned popular practices like indulgences or masses for the dead 
which were purported to reduce the number of years people would need to spend in purgatory. Protestants argued that these measures preyed on the fear of death and undermined the trust in the promise of the salvation in Christ. And so they coined a term, Totenfresserei, or feeding on the dead, to describe this abuse. In this woodcut from the early 1520s, we see this Totenfresserei um, depicted in image. We have before us a kind of female devil who sits on a very large indulgence letter. She holds an alms box in her right hand, eager to receive donations, while her left foot rests in a chalice of holy water. A demon, over here to the left, carries a newly deceased pope through the air, the pope is holding the key of St. Peter, to, this, to, the, to a feast set on a table inside the mouth of the devil. Other monks there await him, and they're going to feast on the bodies of ordinary Christian lay people who are being dismembered, cured, and cooked by other demons, all on a raging fire on top of the devil's head. And so the message is clear and sharp. The clergy feast on the lay people, and the devil feasts on the clergy. By 1518, a conflict between Luther and Rome was emerging. A process against Luther had been initiated, which included charges of heresy. That fall, Luther met with a papal envoy, Cardinal Cayetan, at the Imperial Diet, or Parliament, at Augsburg, where Luther presented his theological ideas rooted in his growing conviction about the authority of Scripture. And Cayetan countered with a simple assertion of papal authority, papal authority over scriptural interpretation and over theology. Luther, in turn, appealed for a general council to hear this, this, this debate and then fled, running back to Wittenberg where it was safe. The following year, in 1519, there was an academic debate about Luther's theology in Leipzig between traditionalist Johann Eck and the innovator Andreas Karlstad, who was a colleague of Luther's. Eck invited Luther into the debate, too, as it turned toward these subjects of purgatory, indulgences, um, penance, and papal authority. Luther declared that scripture alone should be the basis of Christian belief, and he challenged papal supremacy, arguing instead for the higher authority of a general church council. In response, Eck, who was a pretty good debater, brought up the question again of Jan Hus, the Czech reformer, and his condemnation and execution at the Council of Constance. So this forced Luther to choose between Hus's theology, which was much like his, and conciliar authority. And so Luther replied that the Council of Constance had erred in its condemnation of Hus. So in one fell swoop in this debate, Luther had rejected both papal and conciliar authority, the two most widely recognized authorities in Christianity in the late medieval era. From an ecclesiastical perspective, this was nothing less than sedition. It's like religious anarchy. And, and, and it's really here at this point that Luther moves from critiquing individual abuses in the church to challenging the fundamentals of the theology and authority of Catholicism, replacing it with his own theology and the authority of Scripture. But all of this took some years, of course, to unfold. Now, during this same time, Luther himself was having something of a crisis. It's captured best in, this, in the German term Anfechtung, which is a kind of a feeling of anxiety and and guilt and depression and temptation and distress all rolled up together. It's a little bit like what the students feel these days at the end of semester. But for Luther, he was very troubled with the question of how he could be made just before a holy, perfect, and judging God. 
In response to this distress, Luther tried the usual medieval answers, monastic vows, rigorous observance, frequent confession, and so forth. None of these appeased his conscience. But over time, and largely in response to studying the scriptures, he came to the conclusion that the moral purity that would appease the judgment of God could only be attained if it were the gift of God through faith, by grace, based on the atoning death of Jesus Christ according to the scriptures. We Protestants take these ideas for granted now, but they took Luther years to really fully flesh out. Later in his life, Luther looked back on this period of 1519 in, and wrote an account of it. We often call it the Tower Experience. And he shares in this account how he was so struggling with this idea of the justice of God because all he could think about was the holy God just judging and punishing these poor Christians who could do no better than sin because they were born in original sin and had the Ten Commandments to follow. And so he's lashing out at God and, and, and vexed by this. And then after meditating and meditating, he, he came to this realization that, that what it really meant was that the just person lives by faith and that this meant that justice was actually the justice by which the person lives justly based on this gift of God. And, and, and then he, he says, I, I felt like I had been born again and entered into paradise itself through open gates. He says, immediately I saw the whole of Scripture in a different light. I ran through the Scriptures from memory and found that other terms had analogous meanings. For example, the work of God, that is, what God works in us. The power of God, by, that, by which he makes us powerful. The wisdom of God, by which he makes us wise. The strength of God, the salvation of God, the glory of God. All these things that God does in the believer. And again, for him, this took him to the gates of paradise. He, he was raptured about this. So excited. So this, these are the ideas that Luther begins to develop. And in 1520, we see him really working uh, towards a new theology now, based on a series of understandings. We talk about sola scriptura, the idea that the Bible alone is authoritative, um, sola gratia, that salvation's by grace alone. Sola fide, salvation by faith alone. The priesthood of all believers, the idea that there is no separate caste of special Christians in the clergy, that all are Christians alike. The reduction of the number of sacraments down to two or three. Baptism, communion, and maybe penance. He kind of went back and forth on that. And the simplification of other church ceremonies. And, and so these... These um, writings, the address to the German nobility is all about reforming the church. Um, concerning Christian liberty is about uh, salvation by faith and grace and good works as a fruit of salvation. Um, uh, the Babylonian captivity of the church is uh, a, a Latin work about the sacraments. So Luther's beginning to develop this theology of his. But meanwhile, the papacy is responding to the growing problem. Luther is becoming a large problem. And Pope Leo X issues a papal bull, Exerge Domine, Rise Up, O God, in 1520. There was very little support in the Holy Roman Empire for this bill. Luther was, this bull, Luther was already very popular. But it stipulated that his works were to be burned and that he had 60 days in which to recant or face excommunication. And his response, which came on December 10th, 1520, was to burn a copy of the papal bull and a copy of the entire canon law, which represented the Catholic regulation around all these things I've been talking about, indulgences and purgatory and on and on. So he burned these things in a ceremony outside of Wittenberg. And that was, I think, for him, the definite break with the Roman church. And it meant that he would surely stand trial in a Roman court, be excommunicated and executed. And it is actually rather surprising and unusual that that did not happen. And that is the case because the German princes supported Luther to the extent that they required a hearing in which due cause would be shown before any imperial ban could be handed down against Luther or before he would be handed over to Rome. 
And so Luther ends up in front of the imperial diet, the parliament, at Worms in 1521. Emperor Charles V had granted him a, a conduct, a safe passage, to, to get there safely. That may or may not have been encouraging for Luther because Jan Hus had once had a conduct of safe passage, uh, but that did not stop him from being executed. So it was at this formal hearing that um, the, the emperor and the princes were to hear Luther's case. And the imperial accuser, not wanting to start a theological debate, just simply asked two questions. Are these your books? Yes. And will you recant them? No. And it's here that Luther appeals to the authority of Scripture and to his conscience and declares, I'll be the first to throw my books in the fire if I'll be proven wrong by reason and the Bible. And, and this is where he utters his famous words, here I stand, I can do no other. And so that was his hearing in Worms in 1521. He left, went back towards Saxony, and uh, Charles V uh, honored the safe passage, but very soon um, declared Luther an outlaw in the Edict of Worms, which was the pronouncement of the imperial ban. So now Luther was excommunicated and outlawed, banned. Anybody could do anything to him, could kill him with impunity. And for this reason, the elector of Saxony, Frederick the Wise, had Luther kidnapped or captured and taken away to the Wartburg Castle for 10 months to get him out of danger for a time. And it was while Luther was at the Wartburg that his colleagues began to implement the Reformation in Wittenberg. They simplified the Mass. They used German. They abandoned priestly garments. They, they um, kept tithe money for the local use for the poor and those kinds of things. And after about 10 months, then Luther came back and took control and steered the Reformation onward from there. I want to um, spend the last part of what I have to say talking about three images uh, and what they show us about the kind of the key ideas in the early Reformation. Um, and, and one way we can understand uh, Luther's break with Rome is to consider his depiction of the Roman papacy as the Antichrist. And that's what this woodcut shows us. The Antichrist, of course, the eschatological enemy of Christ, the, and, and thus it's the strongest language that Luther has in order to express his repudiation of the papacy. Um, the biblical accounts show that the Antichrist uh, was the opponent of the gospel, was a blasphemer, uh, would be arrogant and persecute Christians. And for Luther, this fit the image that he had of the papacy perfectly. And so in this image, we see from Lucas Cranach, the elder, who often put Luther's propaganda, his Reformation rhetoric into image form. We see this image of Christ and the Antichrist. And Christ is here kissing the feet of his disciples as he washes their feet, John 13. On the other hand, the Pope is on his luxurious throne as his subjects come by and kiss his feet. So it's a very simple image that couldn't contrast the two more strongly. Let me show you another image that reflects these ideas. Throughout the Lutheran Reformation, Protestants claimed to represent the true church. They emphasized their fidelity to Christ, the ancient teaching of the church fathers, and especially again to scripture. And they contrasted that with the illegitimacy of the teachings and practices of the Roman church. So here's a 1569 painting by Lucas Cranach the Younger. It's an epitaph of Paul Eber, who was a colleague of Luther's, a professor in Wittenberg and the pastor of the town church, St. Mary's. And um, here's a close-up of... Um, of the one side. And in this busy painting, we see monks and nuns and bishops and cardinals and the Pope pulling up the vines, destroying the protective fences, and collecting stones to fill up the well in the vineyard of the Lord. 
They throw stakes and vines into fires. They otherwise quarrel and drink and sleep. One monk is shown with a pack of cards falling out of the hood of his habit. In contrast to that, on the other side of the vineyard, we see the reformers hard at work, digging, hoeing, raking, and watering. They erect stakes to support the vines. They gather stones and throw them outside the vineyard. They have the protective fences are strong. The vines are healthy. They've been watered and uh, fertilized. And a good harvest is to be expected. Finally, I want to leave you with this image and a text, a document from the early days of the Reformation. It's a letter written by a Bavarian noblewoman named Argila von Grumbach, and it's one of my favorite Reformation sources because it illustrates so compellingly the powerful rediscovery of the authority and force of Scripture. Grumbach's letter was written in response to the expulsion of a man named Arsacius Seehofer from the University of Ingolstadt on account of his Lutheran beliefs. More importantly, it was written in 1523, only one year after Luther had translated the Bible into a form of German that everyone could read, no matter their dialect. No doubt she had also seen earlier German versions of the Bible as well. She alludes to that at one point. But in her four page, I have a four page excerpt of this letter, and she quotes from the Bible almost 60 times, weaving together texts from many chapters in books of John, Matthew, Ezekiel, Acts, Jeremiah, Hosea, Isaiah, Psalms, 1 Timothy, 1 Corinthians, Deuteronomy, Proverbs, 2 Corinthians, Luke, and Joel. Let me read to you the opening section. The Lord says, John 12, I am the light that has come into the world that none who believe in me should abide in darkness. It is my heartfelt wish that this light should dwell in all of us and shine upon all callous and blinded hearts. Amen. I find there is a text in Matthew 10 which runs, Whoever confesses me before another, I too will confess before my heavenly Father. And Luke 9, Whoever is ashamed of me in my words, I too will be ashamed when I come in my majesty, etc. Words like these, coming from the very mouth of God, are always before my eyes, for they exclude neither woman nor man. And this is why I am compelled as a Christian to write to you, for Ezekiel 33 says, If you see your brother in sin, reprove him, or I will require his blood at your hands. In Matthew 12, the Lord says, all sins will be forgiven, but the sin against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven, neither here nor in eternity. And in John 6, the Lord says, My words are spirit and life. How in God's name can you and your university expect to prevail when you deploy such foolish violence against the word of God? When you force someone to hold the holy gospel in their hands for the very purpose of denying it, as you did in the case of Arsacius Sehofer? When you confront him with an oath and declaration such as this and use imprisonment and even the threat of the stake to force him to deny Christ and his word. Yes, when I reflect on this, my heart and all my limbs tremble. What do Luther and Melanchthon teach you but the word of God? You condemn them without having refuted them. Did Christ teach you so? Or his apostles, prophets, or evangelists? Show me where this is written. You lofty experts, nowhere in the Bible do I find that Christ or his apostles or his prophets put people in prison, burnt or murdered them, or sent them into exile. Don't you know that the Lord says in Matthew 10, Have no fear of him who can take your body, but then his power is at an end. But fear him who has the power to dispatch soul and body into the depths of hell. One knows very well the importance of one's duty to obey the authorities. But where the word of God is concerned, neither pope, emperor, nor princes, as Acts 4 and 5 make so clear, have any jurisdiction. For my part, I have to confess, in the name of God and by my soul's salvation, that if I were to deny Luther and Melanchthon's writing, I would be denying God and his word. 
which may God forfend forever. Amen. And then after she's excoriated the university scholars for a couple of pages, let me read the end. And even if it came to pass, which God forfend, that Luther were to revoke his views, that would not worry me. I do not build on his, mine, or any person's understanding, but on the true rock, Christ himself, which the builders have rejected. But he has made the foundation stone, the head and the cor of the corner, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 3. No other base can be laid than that which is laid, which is Christ. I have no Latin, but you have German, being born and brought up in this tongue. What I have written to you is no women's chit-chat, but the word of God. And I write as a member of the Christian church, against which the gates of hell cannot prevail. Against the Roman, however, they do prevail. Just look at this church. How is it to prevail against the gates of hell? God give us his grace, that we all may be saved. And may God rule us according to his will. Now may his grace carry the day. Amen. This letter thrills me every time I read from it because in it I see the tremendous power of the word of God rediscovered by Luther and embraced by his followers who used it to revive Christianity and to transform the church around the world. And we, 500 years later, can celebrate that reformation. Thank you. Thank you. Well, let's just stand up briefly and stretch, uh, take a good deep breath, and then we will take in part B, the theology of Reformation, with Dr. Bernie Van Der Waal. All right, you can be seated. Okay, thank you again uh, for being with us this evening. It's, it's great to be here. Uh, earlier, uh, Brent had noted uh, that it's great uh, to have a, uh, a, a tall panel because we don't have to be moving mics up and down. Uh, but as a member of this tall panel whose eyesight is not what it was when his 40s, he just wishes he could made the podium a little taller, but uh, the glasses are purely decorative. Uh, it has... <laughs> has nothing to do with uh, advancing years and dimming eyesight or anything like that. Kyle Jansen's already noted for us the complexity uh, of the Reformation. And I think, even though he didn't make this explicit, the difficulty that exists in trying to speak about the Reformation simply, uh, that is, as though it were one thing and as though it were founded on a single event even event uh, as profound as that of October 31st, 1517, again, when Luther shows up at the church door uh, in Wittenberg. Yet many people still ask, and I think I'm probably one of them, the question, what sits, though, at the center of this movement or of this event? And that question continues to be the topic of academic debate, even if everybody is willing to grant that maybe there is no such thing. Right? Is it, is it a social movement? Or is it a political movement? Is it a cultural movement? Is it a religious movement? Or is it a theological movement? And one of the things you'll notice is you begin to head down the road of any one of these guesses uh, is that you won't go very far before you begin to understand how each of the realms is both impinged, impinged on and impinges upon uh, the others. Right? The Reformation is a deeply complex movement. Uh, and uh, so to understand merely one aspect of it, on the one hand, is impossible. Uh, but perhaps, on the other hand, uh, means that you have to understand uh, 
uh, so much more than just that. Should we be so bold, however, as to uh, assert, as many have, that the essence of the Reformation is theological, we still haven't freed ourselves from the bonds of messiness. Undoubtedly, and as Kyle's already pointed out, there are a number of theological issues that are tied to the idea of Reformation. And we're going to explore a few in just a couple of moments. But I have to admit, right now, in the 40 or so minutes that I have, we can only hope to explore a few. There are so many uh, that arrive and arise in so many different ways that to think that we're even going to touch on them all uh, is a bit of a pipe dream to begin with. And so, unfortunately, we're only going to have a time for a few. But the question still rises. It still comes forward. What is theologically at the center of the Reformation? Right? What is that issue, that singular issue, that one can start with, that alone will be the Rosetta Stone uh, for understanding the others? What is that one thing that can... Uh, that we can start with, that alone will help us make sense uh, of all of the others. And here's the answer. I don't think there is one. I don't think there is one, as we're going to see even as we move along in this uh, next few moments. Each of the topics that we're going to talk about, to a greater or to a lesser degree, is influenced by and is informed by the others, uh, which makes even approaching a lecture like this topically uh, a bit of a spider's web because, in a sense, you have to assume something about the discussion of another area in order to discuss uh, any one. But uh, having been given an assignment and uh, trying to do my best to fill that out uh, and to fulfill it, we're going to uh, deal with primarily, again, three. Uh, we'll touch on all sorts of them, but we're going to deal primarily with three. We're going to talk about the doctrine of Scripture. Probably no big surprise. We're going to talk about the doctrine of salvation. Again, probably, uh, for those of you who have done any study in the history of the Reformation and the theology of the Reformation, no big surprise. Uh, and third, and this one might be a bit more of a surprise, and I think it actually is a bigger issue than uh, many of us give it credit for, uh, the idea of the priesthood of all believers. And so that's the map uh, of where uh, we're going to go. Kyle alluded to these a little earlier. I just want to uh, restate them for you now. Historically, many, if not most, of the central theological tenets of the Reformation have been encapsulated in what are often called the five solas of the Reformation. And there they are for you. You have sola scriptura, sola fide, sola gratia, Solo Cristo uh, and Soli Deo Gloria. Sola Scriptura, by Scripture alone. Sola Fide, through faith alone. Sola Gratia, by grace alone. Solo Cristo, by or through Christ alone. And Soli Deo Gloria for the glory of God alone. And when you read Reformation theology or when you talk to somebody uh, about Reformation theology, it's likely that a discussion or even just a name dropping of one of these solas uh, will come about, will come up. But I think I want to start by clearing up a misunderstanding uh, and start here. Here. 
one should not think that because the reformers placed emphasis on these five things, these five doctrines, these five topics, that they were completely absent from the theology and practice of the wider church in that day. That they were wholly absent, wholly gone. That they were uh, doctrina absconditus, uh, uh, a, a, a hidden or, or, or veiled uh, doctrine or teaching. So what the reformers sought to address in each of these topics, and we'll unpack some of them again as we move along, but what they sought to address uh, was not the entire absence of, for example, a reverence for scripture in the 16th century. Instead, and this is true for each of the solas, what the reformers sought to combat was an understanding that each of these things, while necessary for salvation, was insufficient in and of themselves. And that in some way they needed to be amended by or supplemented by something else. That is, that each needed something to be added to it in order to be effective. And so, sola is one of those words that the famous theologian Inigo Montoya would say. That word you keep using... I do not think it means what you think it means. Uh, my students will know that at some point in every lecture, I have to bring up the movie The Princess Bride, and it, it fits here. Right, that sola does not mean what we often have understood it to mean, this idea of exclusively, only, or solely. And so with that warning, I, uh, I want us to sort of now move ahead. And we'll take a look and we'll start with, which, you know, in an evangelical school is a good place to start, with the doctrine of sola scriptura. This idea has often been called the formal principle of Reformation theology. And by that phrase, the formal principle, all I really mean uh, and all that is really intended by that statement is this idea that scripture... And scripture alone is the authoritative and final source for all theology. The formal principle. That is, that the message of scripture authoritatively and in a sense finally determines the shape of all Christian theology, all Christian doctrine, and therefore all Christian practice. Basically translated, the Latin phrase sola scriptura, of course, means through or by scripture alone. Now, many have taken this phrase, sola scriptura, and these people aren't hard to find, but they've taken it to mean through or by a scripture alone, that is, uh, in the sense that only scripture serves as a source for Christian doctrine or Christian scripture on its own, with no other, serves as a source for Christian doctrine and practice. Uh, and when they attribute this to the reformers, they often assert uh, that what it meant for the reformers is a thorough rejection of anything else that might inform or determine or influence our theology or our practice. Whether that be, and of course, these were some of the favorite whipping boys, tradition, the creeds, or the church fathers. Significant councils, significant authors, uh, etc. That, however, is not what the reformers meant by sola scriptura. That is not what Reformation theology means when it talks about sola scriptura. The reformers, I think it's important, if not essential for us to remember, had a place in the development of theology 
for tradition, for significant authors, for the creeds, in the forming of the church's even most basic, uh, basic theology. This is not hard to see. We see it really at least in two ways. That is a way coming in and a way going out. One of the things I like to point out to students in a class called Theologies of the Reformation is how often in the institutes of the Christian religion, the arch reformer in some people's minds, John Calvin, regularly refers to the church fathers in making his theological case. And it's far more regular than most people realize. And he relies on them as having an authority in theology. And so the reformers actually use the tradition in the development of their theology. On the other hand, and sort of in uh, another way, Luther develops a tradition that he wants to uh, inform uh, people's theology. And so he develops catechisms, rules of faith, and confessions, which are to inform and guide the theology of those who follow in his wake. And so for the reformers, it's not a question of whether tradition whatever that may be, should play a role in the development of theology. It was really a question of what role such things should play. Practically speaking, as the Reformers understood it, sola scriptura may be better understood as upholding the primacy of Scripture, and therefore, if we're going to go all Latin, and, you know, I spent money on four semesters of Latin, I'm going to use it, uh, it would be better to understand it as prima scriptura. Right? Uh, and this distinction actually explicitly is made by Philip Melanchthon, uh, Luther's lieutenant, uh, as early as 1539 in his work called Church and the Authority of the Word. And it's interesting to me, and a shock often to my students, that each of the reformers, at different times and in different ways, would seek to show the truth of their theological positions by aligning themselves not only with Scripture, but also with the Church Fathers. And for Luther, it was particularly Augustine. But also the creeds, the historic creeds, and the theological conclusions of the ecumenical councils. And these were all called upon by the Reformers to bolster and inform the theology that they were proposing. In a sense, what the reformers are responding to uh, is the historic Catholic doctrine, often known uh, as the deposit of faith. And basically, and perhaps far too basically, uh, given the time I have, what this doctrine asserts was that there were two distinct but equal categories of authoritative divine revelation, sacred scripture, and sacred to tradition. And in response to this doctrine, and for various reasons, the reformers were sure to assert that while tradition had its place, it was not on equal footing with Scripture. While tradition had its place, Scripture and Scripture alone was the final authority and arbiter of Christian faith and practice. And while there were other authorities for the reformers, especially again, the church fathers, the historic creeds, and the ecumenical councils, these were always subject to the rule of scripture. That is, they were an authority, the creeds, the church fathers, and the councils, but they were always a derived authority. Uh, that is, they were authoritative in as far as they echoed uh, and witnessed the testimony of Scripture. So the Reformers did not understand Scripture to be the lone source or resource for developing theology and determining practice. Instead, they understood Scripture to be what some have called <clears throat> 
the norma normans, or the norming norm. That is, the reformers understood scripture not only to be a source for life and doctrine itself, but also to be the unchallenged measure or the canon for all other possible sources and authorities. It had, in a sense, veto power over any of these other authorities. And while the other sources may be legitimate, they were trustworthy only in as far as they adhered to the testimony of Scripture. And so if they held any uh, authority, it was always as a derived authority. It was always as a secondary uh, authority. It was always as a dependent authority. And consequently, unlike Scripture, the reformers understood that all these other forms were always open to reform and particularly open to the reform of uh, uh, governed by Scripture. And so rather than being the Norman Normans, and we're going to give you an introduction to Latin here, uh, it uh, becomes instead the Normi Normati, the normed norm. So they were norms. They had a, they had a canonical role but only as they were in agreement with Scripture. Yet, they still carried authority, very real authority. And unless Scripture demanded otherwise, they should be soberly heeded. Uh, Luther himself makes this pretty plain when in one place he talks about the role of uh, these traditions as being, quote, a little less, but still real. A little less, unquote, but still real in relation to Scripture. The question, of course, comes, why did the Reformers grant such great power to Scripture? Uh, and to a great degree, it's because of what they understood Scripture to be. I'm not a very good preacher. I'm going to have four points here rather than three. This first one, of course, if you come from an evangelical background, is going to be of no surprise to you whatsoever. That it, the, the scriptures are inspired. That is, they came directly from God. It is actually his word, the very words of God. Of course, they ground this at uh, at the very least, on 2 Timothy 3.16, that talks about all Scripture is being God-breathed. But again, the, the idea is that the Scriptures find their source in God himself as his word, directly and explicitly. What it says is what God has said. And of course, the argument goes like this. Since its source is God himself, since it is actually his word that he brought about by inspiration, that it's actually his word to us, it carries with it, therefore, his divine authority, which, of course, cannot be matched and does not lack. And so for many of the reformers, the power of the scriptures particularly in relation to human salvation, rests in the fact that the Spirit of God communicates truth to us. God's truth on God's authority based on God's omniscience uh, and his uh, power. This uh, next little bit I could go off for on a while, and maybe we'll get a chance to do this later. But one of the things I think we need to remember about the Reformers that I think is often forgotten when it comes to Scripture is that they had a very mystical, they tend to have a very mystical understanding of the Scriptures. So much so that not only did they understand that Scripture communicated truth, but actually in some way communicated the person of God himself to those who read the scriptures. Not just ideas, but the very person of God himself, what I might call a, a sacramental understanding 
uh, of the scriptures, uh, or what we might be tempted to call a dynamic understanding of the scriptures. But I'm going to stop myself right there and move along. Perspicuous. Ironically, a very unclear word to us today, whose definition is clear, obvious, easy to see, right? The clarity of Scripture. The Reformation developed in the wake of humanism, and, and not humanism in the way that we're used to thinking of it, and perhaps we'll have a chance to unpack that a little bit more later. But humanism, at the very least, was a movement in and around this time of which Luther, uh, of which Luther was less a part, but Erasmus was clearly a part, Calvin was clearly a part, uh, Zwingli was clearly a part, and as Kyle noted earlier, uh, Luther certainly at least took advantage of what uh, humanism gave him uh, and ran with that. But, but this, this humanism had an attraction to, as a movement, an intellectual movement, that had an attraction to uh, um, and esteemed the classical period, uh, in art particularly and in literature as well. That is the Roman and the Greek eras. And especially for the reformers, there was also a great esteeming of the wisdom and literature of the Christian scriptures, which they viewed as being part and parcel, though still distinct, from this classical era. And this idea of clarity, particularly the clarity of the scriptures, was a bit of a breath of fresh air to the reformers who lived in the shadow of the seemingly convoluted uh, and obscure theological writings that had marked much of uh, the Middle uh, and Dark Ages uh, particularly the writings of uh, such figures of William of Ockham and Duns, uh, Scotus, etc. But beyond that, given God's role in Scripture, both in its inspiration and in its illumination to those who would pick it up and read, God ensured that what he wanted to Scripture to say was actually not only said, but that it was actually communicated. Right? That they both could see it and, in a sense, they could get it. And therefore, since Scripture is clear in its message, particularly in the area of faith and salvation, which is its purpose for the Reformers, the average reader, the average hearer, could understand what it said. And therefore, and this is a pretty big therefore, no other voice was necessary to aid in the communication or the interpretation of the gospel. The average reader, the average hearer, did not need some ecclesial authority to explain this obscure writing to them. Rather, it was clear, or at the very least, clear enough. And therefore, uh, we can understand why the reformers would be so intent on translating the scriptures into the vernacular. Because the people didn't understand Latin, but they did understand their own tongue. And if they could get the language, uh, the scriptures in the language of the people, uh, the people, of course, would be aided in their piety and dedication. Effective. Given that scripture was inspired, given that scripture was clear, and given that God continued to work in and through it, the reformers were also convinced that scripture was effective. That it was able to produce within humanity the result for which God intended and had created it. In the realm of faith and salvation, Scripture was not only powerful, it was able. Right? It could do, given what it was, what God intended and designed for it to do. And therefore, in a sense, almost logically, it leads to the fourth, that Scripture is sufficient. Sola Scriptura. Scriptura. 
While it may not answer all of the questions that we may bring to it, it is sufficient in and of itself to bring about its goal, faith, Christian life, and Christian conduct. Sola Scriptura. There is no need for another revelation in regard to faith, Christian life, or conduct, nor is there need for another to explain or interpret it to us. Contemporary challenges. I'm just going to throw these out really quickly. We might get to them uh, uh, in just a few moments. The question of subjectivism. If it's so clear and the average person can understand it, we run into the danger of subjectivism, right? That may lead to the ideas of isolationism or anarchy or everyone doing what's right in his or her own eyes, which, by the way, is not a compliment uh, in Scripture. I wonder if our understanding of sola scriptura in our own day is a bit of familiarity breeding contempt. Talk about that later. And of course, uh, what does this have to do, given this setting, uh, with lay and particularly pastoral pep preparation uh, and what it is that uh, those people need to be studying? Okay. Sola fide, sola fide and sola gratia. Through faith alone and by grace alone. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. I learned it a long, long time ago when I was in a navigator's Bible study. For it is by grace you've been saved through faith, and this not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no man may boast. Teach a child in the way he should go. And when he's much older, he will not depart from it. Right, we have Luther's discovery of Romans 1.17. His aha moment, as many describe it. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. A righteousness that is by faith. From first to last, just as it is written. The righteous will live by faith. And Paul there is calling on Habakkuk uh, chapter 2, verse 4. This idea of sola fide and sola gratia uh, is often known as the material principle of the Reformation. Uh, by this simply meaning that out of which it came. Right, that the exercise of faith results in justification. The importance of justification by faith alone, by grace alone, to Reformation theology cannot be overestimated. And the Reformers themselves realized this. Calvin called it the main hinge on which all true religion turns. Luther called it that doctrine on which the church stands or falls. And basically at the heart of the idea uh, is this for the reformers, that justification that initial work of God's uh, salvation in our lives, is a gift of God based on who he is, loving, gracious, long-suffering, and in spite of who we are, sinful, treacherous. And of course, that favorite word of so many people in Reformation thought, depraved. And so you end up with what uh, Luther called uh, uh, humanity as uh, simul justus et peccator. At the same time, in one in the same 
moment, even in the same motion, just or justified by the grace of God and sinner by our own nature. And that both are the reality for the believer this side of Christ's return. The main foe, of course, uh, to the reformers in this area is an idea of what we today would call a works righteousness. Right, the reformers had a strong conviction in regard to the sinfulness of humanity and its consequent inability, total inability, that it can do nothing. It is able to do nothing. It is fit to do nothing in regard to its salvation. So thorough, so degrading has been our sin that there is nothing that we can do that is of such quality as to merit God's favor. And it's the realization of this reality that leads to that word that Kyle uh, talked about just uh, not long ago, this unfechtung, this festering, uh, brooding, foreboding deep within his soul, realizing that no matter what he did, he could not merit the grace of God and uh, uh, justification. And it's this reason, it's for this reason that at least in part the reformers rejected the idea that there existed those activities, those devotions that were understood to move an otherwise reluctant God's hand to merit or even to earn God's grace. Right, for most of the reformers, this idea of being able to earn by or otherwise your salvation was first of all an affront to the gospel, an insult to the gospel. Practically, it did nothing but build false hope for those who thought maybe it might do something. And third, it just further enslaved the people to hopelessness. Right? And this is why, at least in part, Calvin, Luther, Zwingli, but again, particularly Luther, found the indulgences such an offense uh, was this not only... Uh, the abuse of the peasants and the average person, but that they were selling them hopelessness. They were selling them nothing in a sense that they already uh, didn't already have. Right? They did not, could not do what they promised to do. They made the poor only poorer. They made the rich only richer. And they offended the gracious nature of God's salvation. Philip Melanchthon, again, uh, Martin Luther's right-hand man, defined faith simply as this. The recognition and reception of divine mercy. And a very passive understanding of even that phrase not something we acquire, but something we receive. But even for the reformers, faith alone still must be directed to the proper object. Faith alone is hopeless. It's not solitary faith. Our emphasis must be on the proper object of our faith, the work and person of Jesus Christ alone. Solo Cristo. Challenges. Well, even in Luther's own day, people understood that this kind of teaching could lead to what was called antinomianism or lawlessness. Right? Those who were justified but never expect to live a sanctified life. And then maybe, just maybe, Luther's followers might place so much emphasis on this hinge uh, and uh, on uh, this uh, doctrine on which uh, 
the church stands or falls, that it may end up understanding salvation as being nothing other than and nothing more than justification. There's a new book out in, I think, about chapter 5 or 6 that addresses this to some degree and actually says that contemporary evangelicals get Luther wrong often on this. The priesthood of all believers. At the heart of the idea of the priesthood of all believers is this thought that by the work of Christ and by the agency of the Holy Spirit, that believers have direct and immediate access to God. The language of a priest to us might sound um, a little proud, a little daring. But the reformers would note that that's exactly what scripture calls the followers of Christ. In 1 Peter 2.9, they're a royal priesthood. In Revelation 5.10, they have been made a kingdom and priests to serve our God. You find that uh, Luther talks about those uh, specifically in uh, 1520 and calls on those uh, in his uh, writing to the Christian nobility of the German nation. But also 1 Corinthians 4.1 has the same idea to it. No one should regard us as anything else than ministers or priests of Christ and dispensers of the mysteries of God. And we find that again in Luther's very good year of 1520. He would have gotten uh, uh, tenure just on uh, the work he produced in 1520 alone uh, in his work on the Babylonian captivity of the church. All right, so the idea is deeply grounded for the reformers in scripture and its identification of the church. And in a sense, uh, what's going on with this doctrine is a kickback uh, at a number of things uh, that were uh, at least understood to be going on at the time. Again, Kyle talked about this. Uh, a medieval separation of God's people into the secular people of the church and the sacred people of the church. The secular and the sacred classes. The secular, the lay people, and the sacred, the clerics. With very clear lines about who was responsible for what and who had the privilege of what. And who had which rights and who had which powers. And this, of course, was problematic for the reformers. Interestingly enough, most of whom were clerics. Another problem going on at this time is what seems to be, uh, to many of the reformers, a, a growing uh, list of mediators between God and the church. Particularly the secular class and God. You had monks, you had priests, you had bishops, you had popes, you had Mary, you had the saints, you had icons, often called the tin gods, uh, etc. Uh, and there you will see a vial uh, of Christ's blood, uh, which is housed in the most beautiful city of uh, Brugge, uh, Belgium. Not Bruges, as the French would pronounce it, but Brugge, as my father, who was born there, would pronounce it. But we see this idea even in Luther's own biography, right? Luther was well acquainted with this because when he gets in trouble in 1505, what does he call out? Okay, Kyle, you're the only guy in the room who knows. St. Anne, right? He doesn't call out to God. He doesn't call out to Christ. He doesn't even call it to Mary because by that time she's been venerated. So the next place to go to is to Jesus' grandma. Right, because certainly he'll he'll listen to her. And what you end up having is an effectual spiritual captivity, the reformers would say, of the laity and the setting of the context for spiritual abuse. And simony, the buying of ecclesial offices as a financial and political investment. And maybe if we get time in a moment, we can talk about how. Uh, the indulgence controversy in Luther's own life was tied to this idea of simony, the buying and selling of church offices and therefore church power. But the priesthood of all believers is a doctrine for the reformers that is grounded in both the primacy and exclusivity of Christ as 
the church's mediator. 1 Timothy 2.5 For there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus. Right? This hope is grounded in the indwelling of Christ by the power of the Spirit within his people. And for most of the Reformers, perhaps out of step with many of us in this room, this was received at baptism. This idea of the priesthood, though, for the Reformers was not only a privilege, but more importantly, and perhaps more greatly, a responsibility. In our being baptized by the Spirit, we are made priests to fulfill a vocation. As Luther would say, we are baptized to preach the gospel. That the priesthood of all believers is a doctrine that speaks at least for the Reformers uh, or talks as much as or, or more than about a position. It talks about a responsibility. Even if in the practical outworkings of the local community there would remain functional distinctions. Okay. Time is clicking. Contemporary challenges. Well, I think we're going to get to those, and certainly you can take us there. Uh, one last slide. Uh, just uh, if you want to read more about Reformation theology, uh, here are four places uh, to go. Uh, if you're going to take my class in Reformation theology, you can get started on your reading early. Uh, it's pretty much from the syllabus. Uh, and uh, uh, James Payton's uh, book, Getting uh, the Reformation Wrong, is a fantastic work. Mark Knoll's book, Confessions and Catechisms of the Reformation. McGrath, who every year seems to put out a new book on Reformation thought, uh, is good. Uh, Denny Johns and uh, Timothy George's are all great books. Uh, and there's a couple others I could talk to you about as well, but my time is up. Okay, Thank you. Burning. And again, let's just stand and take a quick stretch, and then we're going to have a question and answer time. And if you have a question, I would uh, invite you to just raise your hand, and I'll try and call upon you. If you have one online, if you want to use the chat window to send that in, and we hope to pick up on that question. Just give us a second here to reorganize and then uh, have a seat. We have the other mics, please. Yeah, test one, two. There we are. I, I think we're back. I think we're back in action. So for uh, the remaining 25 minutes that we have here, we want to talk about some, some questions and start to uh, bridge the gap between history and today. Um, I know that a Reformation tour is coming up, and in part of the rationale for why one should come on the Reformation tour, uh, the statement was made that the Reformation changed a lot more than the church. Uh, it changed education, it changed politics, it changed economics, it changed uh, family, uh, had impact on a variety of very practical matters for people from within the church, yes, but way beyond into the rest of society. And so I just wonder whether you could talk a little bit about, uh, either one of you, about any impact that you'd like to pick up on from the Reformation, maybe on broader, more personal, daily living matters like that? Well, for my part, I would say you can go almost any direction with that question. Um, um, Stephen Osmond has written some really neat things on family life as a product of the Reformation. There's been a lot of debate about its impact on women. Some have argued that um, it uh, had a negative impact because women had a place in the medieval cloisters and they had their own sort of world there. 
but I think a uh, much stronger case is made for um, a positive impact in the development of a of a wholesome and, uh, and and positive family life. I mean, there's dozens of examples, but that's just one that comes to mind. So, um, Katharina von Bora, the wife of Martin Luther, uh, he selected her. It was a scandal that he selected her. First of all, a priest getting married. Um, uh, in what way was she uh, prominent as a woman in the uh, Reformation movement? Well, first of all, partly just because she married that strange fellow. It was a huge uh, issue because as much as you know, he was uh, barking against uh, the church at the time, so was she by uh, consenting to it. What's interesting uh, to me uh, is that when Luther holds his famous table talks uh, in his home, Also for children, right? Children become um, uh, people uh, as opposed to potential people. Uh, and of course, you know, it, it, it moves its way out into democracy. I think if there's no reformation, uh, modern democracy uh, is neither non-existent or it is fundamentally different. Uh, because mm -hmm. one of this, I think, is related to uh, the concept of the priesthood of all believers. So, uh, and uh, clarity in uh, seeing it. Uh, you both picked up on some of the things that the church uh, gained uh, through the Reformation, some of the focal points, some of the corrections that were brought into the church. Uh, what about losses? As, uh, as there's a reaction to Catholicism and a breaking away against um, deemed heresy and um, maybe the abuse of power within, the, not maybe, the abuse of power within the church, the subjugation of people and feasting on the, on the plights of the poor and such through indulgences. So a lot of those things were, were uh, protested and corrected, so that's fantastic. What about losses? As we step away and there's this divergence between uh, now the, um, the uh, reformers and those that stuck with the Holy Catholic Church. Well, the, I mean, the simplest answer to that, is, I think, is unity, right? The question of the fragmentation of the Christian Church um, is a major Reformation legacy and, and one that's uh, problematic in many respects. We often, I mean, this is a more theological question probably for Bernie than for me, but it seems to me that the, the t truth and unity have been combatants in the modern era um, uh, as, as people stand for what they think is truth, a particular truth, unity seems to suffer. And so this is a major conundrum, I think, that comes out of the Reformation. Yeah, we, we get back into uh, what, ironically, Augustine, you know, uh, in several many ways, Luther's teacher actually argued against in the third and fourth century, which was Donatism, mm -hmm. these people who were too willing and too quick uh, to, to, uh, to judge, divide judge. the church. Yeah. Uh, and interestingly enough, uh, Luther, who continues to hold close to Augustine in so many ways, uh, actually fosters that. Uh, you know, the surprise for me, uh, and I hinted at it a little bit in the lecture, I think one of the, the great losses that we've had in uh, the Protestant church, uh, because at least a, a, in part a, a misunderstanding of what went on in the Reformation or what the reformers were trying to accomplish, is a lack of an understanding of the normative nature of holiness in the life of, of the church and the life of believers. That is, if it's all about justification, and if justification is only received by grace, and if my works have nothing to do with it, which I think is a misreading of the Reformation, then why bother? Right? And so uh, you know, we live in it, we, we uh, end up living in a rather licentious understanding uh, because we understand our salvation not to be uh, founded on justification, but existing totally and solely on justification. So the idea of sanctification for much of the Protestant church was lost practically. 
One of the things that really surprised me when I went on the Reformation tour was the trashing of the Catholic churches and all the uh, icons, uh, uh, much of it, the, uh, the symbolic nature, the, uh, even the artistic, what I would, maybe the, the mystical element, mm -hmm. uh, the aura of being in a place where there's history and there's, there's women and men who have gone on before us and, and there's a lot of art uh, to mm -hmm. point back to that. And all of this, much of this got trashed and then the Protestant uh, churches were just simple and, and clean and uh, bare. And, and so what about the loss of um, mysticism? I was heartened by what you said about, yeah. the, uh, about the scriptures, that there was a very strong uh, focus on the mystical nature of the dynamic reading of scripture. But what about losses in the whole area of uh, the mystery of God and, and the, um, uh, the interface? Kind of the, yeah. uh, I think that... that understanding of images, whether it's um, um, painted or carved, um, that varied so much within Reformation Europe, right? I mean, Luther himself didn't reject all of that. There was some iconoclasm, some destruction of images um, in Wittenberg for a time, but he actually put a stop to that. And, and Lutherans per se don't uh, don't have a, a large problem with that. That was much more the case uh, in the Swiss Reformation under Zwingli and Calvin. And uh, there is where you find those bare churches now. I know that in my own research in the Reformation in the city of Basel, there's a really profound um, about face of the understanding of these images from, as Bernie was talking about before, their role, they had a, media, a mediating role in a sense, to help in devotion to connect with God. Um, and overnight, it seems, they become idols. So much so that in the case of the Reformation in Basel, they, they trash the churches, they drag this crucifix through the street, and they shout, um, if you are God, save yourself. If you're man, then bleed. I mean, they attack very violently this crucifix, which would seem like such a shocking thing to do. But it, it relates, I think, very profoundly to the sharp and really abrupt change in their understanding of these things from the status of mediators to idols. And, hmm. and what, what adds to that problem, uh, and this is one of the things that I think the Reformation initially actually addresses well, uh, is that many of the priests and many of these local churches were uneducated, many illiterate, uh, in actually rather being able to theologically or biblically combat this idolatry uh, actually ended up actually foster it. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and you know, uh, you know, when you make a change sometimes, you know, in order to make the change, you gotta, you got to kick hard, and there's losses, but, you know, for the reformers, uh, people, uh, you know, as long as those things were up there, you know, the, some of the reformers, particularly Zwingli, uh, in Zurich and others, thought, you know, the people are going to not be understanding the, the role of these things properly, until such a time as we put them away. You know, Zwingli was more than that, but hmm. uh, the putting away of them for a while, I, I don't think, uh, in that context, would have been essentially that idea. Okay. Uh, one of the online questions was regard to uh, changes in the canon of Scripture uh, that was brought forth by the Protestant movement. So, how did the Bible change? Uh, why did that change? Uh, it was one of the questions. Well, one of the, the myths that we have to overcome is uh, the understanding that uh, uh, the canons have been securely closed uh, by uh, the time of the Reformation. Uh, it, it hadn't. Uh, there were uh, discrepancies and discussions about what was in and what was out and how much something was in and how much something was out. Uh, and so uh, there's a, a little bit more of a free willingness to it than I think we often realize. Uh, Luther, uh, uh, particularly, uh, had difficulties with uh, what we would now call the uh, canon uh, the uh, the deuterocanonical books and the pseudepigraphal books or the ap apocryphal books. Uh, and so for him, those were right out. Uh, don't even bring them in and, and sully the matter, especially since some of those books were being appealed to uh, against him 
Uh, so he had a bit of a political reason for that as well. Uh, he also, though, had some problems with some other books that we would have considered canonical today. Uh, Hebrews was a problem for him. Uh, uh, Jude, I think, was a problem for him. And then, of course, as many of you may know, James was a, an epistle of straw, uh, Luther would say. And so uh, at the very least, he wants to put it at the back of the Bible. Uh, you know, because nobody actually ever finishes a book they start. Uh, or maybe they just jump right to the end and read it. Uh, so, uh, but uh, that, even there it takes time to, to settle up. So there's somewhat of a piling on effect here. Once, one, once we've decided to go out and say that the Pope is the Antichrist, so to speak, okay, <laughs> we've dared say that. Uh, what else have we been picking at the edges of uh, inside... Uh, the church amongst um, uh, the priests as they've been there was diversity of thought on a variety of other things so uh, was there a sense of now that we've dared uh, the ultimate offenses here uh, that we would look at things such as we look at the canon of scriptures well I think to some degree everything became open for discussion yeah uh, mm -hmm. uh, again even the scriptures so so the scriptura again you know you got to qualify it partly by going well well what is it yeah uh, and that's what, you know, uh, ended up in being, uh, it being such a tumultuous time, is that, that everything that had been understood to be solid to this point, final to this point. Uh, now there's fluid. Now, yeah, now it's, it's really beginning to teeter. Uh, it, it's easier to poke and prod. Uh, didn't begin with Luther, you know, in the words of Billy Joel, he didn't start the fire. Uh, it had been burning for quite some time, right? Uh, Heiko Obermann's uh, work on uh, uh, Forerunners of the Reformation talks about this, Huss and Wycliffe and the Lollards, etc. as Kyle talked about. But yeah, once you, once you poke at ultimate authority and dethrone that ultimate authority, uh, and then you raise up this idea of the autonomous individual and uh, the priesthood of all believers, then uh, the gloves are off. Yeah. Well, I just, I mean, I am endlessly fascinated by the question of authority in the Reformation. I mean, I think that's, that's so interesting. You see it so clearly at, at the Diet of Worms that, that Luther and his uh, opponents are, are simply speaking right past each other because he appeals to scriptural authority and they appeal to the authority uh, of the uh, papal authority. And, um, and, and, and so they're, they're just, their starting points are so completely different. I've got a quote from uh, Luther that I think I mentioned to you guys when we were meeting, talking about tonight. And I said, have you heard of this quote before? But uh, I read it years ago, and it just captured my imagination. So many uh, things that Luther has to say about God's word as being um, uh, so powerful. But he, he said, I did nothing. The word of God did everything. I opposed indulgences and all the papists, but I never did it with force. I simply taught, preached, and wrote God's word. Otherwise, I did nothing. And while I slept, and while I drank Wittenberg beer with my friends, <laughs> Philip and Nicholas, the word so greatly weakened the papacy that no prince or emperor ever inflicted such losses upon it. I did nothing. The word of God did everything. Well, except that might right, yeah. be a little disingenuous, <laughs> well, uh, especially the part about, you know, never doing anything with force. I mean... <laughs> Luther, are these his Luther, words, though? Yeah, yeah. Luther, oh, yeah, yeah. Luther was a, I mean, the, he was a propagandist as well. They, they were, they created this, I mean, the example, that's why I used the example of the papacy as the Antichrist. They used these um, ideas as, as, you know, often blunt instruments to really um, beat the church with. And so um, you have, we have to be a little careful um, to recognize that at times they caricature the church, right? Yeah. Yeah. So and there's plenty of evidence. And I think Bernie's point about that it's not that these, some of these things like reverence for the word or, or for piety and so on didn't exist in the, in the earlier medieval church. Of course they did. But and so you have to take it all a bit with a little bit of yep. a grain of salt. Yep. But there's no question at the same time that this, this notion of the power of the word, right? I mean, this is what I think is so fascinating that, that and that's why I love that Argila von Grumbach letter. I mean, she, she just hammers on these scholars with this Bible Quoting. and makes this point that, 
I am a Christian, I can use this Bible, and this is the word of God, and you're against it, and, and so you're wrong. Like, and, and this is very, very forcefully done. So this idea of scripture as such a powerful weapon is, I think, key. What, you know, uh, and now, zooming up to today, and partly I'm just winding Kyle up here, uh, it's, which, we've hung out for almost 20 years, him and I, and we were part of the great class of 1999. But um, I remember uh, I used to have an assignment where I'd send students to different traditions to watch their worship. And I remember being uh, amused by how many students would go to a Catholic or, or high liturgy church and watch them carry the Bible in on high. With great respect. With great respect. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, they'd, be, they'd be shocked and, and to some degree appalled by this. And then he leaves the rest for Kyle. I want to thank you. <laughs> You're riling. I have up. a thought about that. No, I. I mean, it, it is fascinating to me that that um, yes, in the Catholic tradition certainly, but these early um, Reformation churches, when they developed new Reformation liturgies that centered on the Word as opposed to the Eucharist, brought all kinds of scripture reading into the service, not scripture as something to be explained. We were talking about this earlier. Not something to be preached, but just simply scripture to be read. And you have these readings, right? Old Testament, New Testament, Gospel, Psalms, and all that. And, and um, it, the irony is that in so many of our evangelical churches, which are supposed to be these, we're, we're, we're Bible people, and yet that's been lost. Yeah. And I think that is just a, a really challenging question if we want to move into the sort of implications for today's side of things, yeah. that where is the scripture in our evangelical church right. services? And if I can poke a different bear a little bit, it, it's interesting to me that, you know, when we look now to hire pastors, and, you know, mm -hmm. we'll see if I get an elbow from the district superintendent. Um, I wonder if the, the, the job description that we advertise for pastors today is not more like a job description for a medieval monk than it is for a Reformation priest. That is, can you run the machine? If you have theological and biblical literacy, that's okay. Well, it might even be kind of nice. But I want to know, can you run the machine? Can you run a home gr group Bible study? Can you develop a map? Can you, uh, can you run the program? Which the medieval monks did, mm -hmm. but that's yet yet that's the reformers' critique is that that was what they did. Mm. Mm. <laughs> There's a question at the back, <laughs> conveniently. <laughs> that was a bit of a dodge. So the question is concerning uh, uh, justice, that the reformers were interested in caring for the poor and that the indulgences were actually extracting money from the poor. That was the question? And what sure. is the impact in our current sure. context? I mean, on the historical side, um, there's no question that the drainage of money from the region we would call Germany down into Rome to pay for the building of St. Peter's, this is a major fear of at St. Peter's, that's indulgence money there, um, What was a major grievance. And so one of the first things the reformers did at the local level was retain the tithe money in order to care for people, hospitals and orphanages and education and so on. In terms of our own day, I mean, I think in this respect, I would say that in recent years, uh, our churches have become far more engaged in what we would call social initiatives. Um, so I think there's some hope there, but, but you know, there still is a lot of money that goes into facilities, and that would be a question that might be worth um, considering. All right. My own tradition, right, has, has its history. Uh, the, what, you know, Wesley would, Wesleyans would call the preferential option for the poor. Mm -hmm. uh, the problem, of course, is one of the problems that happens is when you uh, when you have an outreach to the poor, you usually better their station in life, and they tend to experience what one of my advisors would call the embourgeoisement, mm -hmm. 
right? The, the rising up of the social ladder, and uh, uh, and you, you you end up actually taking them not only out of their situation, but but out of their situation, uh, and uh, and so it becomes a, a left behind thing, right? So my own denomination, whose very first church was planted in the heart of the barrio, is is only today in some uh, situations beginning to re think moving back to the barrio. Yeah. Yeah. And there's been quite a bit of correction, I think, in the evangelical church. I can't speak for all churches, but certainly in the Alliance and many other evangelical churches, I think an embracing of a wider gospel, a more holistic gospel. The gospel is indeed a person. It is a message to be proclaimed that has content to it, but it's also an effect, and the effect is the love of God moving through his people, people into culture, uh, bearing uh, justice and mercy. And I, I see that everywhere that I go now. If I could just add one related thought to that, I think uh, uh, the, the flip side of that is the question of luxury. I, I commented a number, a number of times at how much of a, a, a criticism that was for the reformers and those who came before them of the luxury of the higher clergy, the luxury of the church. And I think that is something that bears some thought in our context. We have upper middle class of churches, many of us, and, and that luxury is there. And, and I think of, in this case, not the reformers so much, but even going back further to the Franciscans and, and just ask the question, can any of us imagine taking a vow of poverty? Um, how foreign a concept that would be in our uh, church cultures, many of us. And ironically, and I'm going to be really quickly here because we have a question over here. Ironically, the churches that have stayed with the poor historically have been the Catholic churches mm -hmm. who have stayed in the neighborhood, mm -hmm. stayed in the barrio. Mm -hmm. Great. Question over here? Yeah, I think one of the uh, unintended side effects of the charismatic um, kind of renewal movement was the subversion of worthy sacraments being used for those whose worship experience is spiritual experience. Do you think the Reformation can speak to that? You, you have these kinds of um, developments in the Reformation itself, right? You have spiritualist movements that emerge in the Reformation itself. And uh, I know um, one book on the Reformations and their legacy that I've used before in teaching talks about this relationship between um, scripture, tradition, and spirit as, com as competing, and I don't mean that in a bad way, but just competing authorities. And in any, any one of those can, can go out of balance, right? So we can have churches that are so, so word-focused that they, there's no life, no spirit in them, and they pretend as if there was nothing that came before them. Similarly, churches you know, that are so tradition that they lose sight of Scripture and truth and so on. And the same on the spirit side, that the spiritual aspect can become so um, uh, overpowering that, that the, the anchoring in the word is lost. And, and again, the idea of of a continuity of belief is lost as well. And, uh, and I think it's hard, you know, in Western Canada, it's hard. I mean, uh, uh, everything's so new here. And the idea of tradition is kind of lost in us. When we, um, when we traveled uh, a couple of years ago on a, on a travel study and went to Evensong in churches like St. Paul's in London or in Lincoln or, or Durham, these churches where People have been worshiping for hundreds and hundreds of years. There's something very profound about yeah. that. And so that, that kind of anchoring, I agree, is often lost on, on us. And I wonder if there's not a non... I wonder if the modern charismatic movement isn't non-sacramental. I wonder if it just locates the sacrament someplace else. Uh, and for classical Pentecostalism, right, uh, it's, it's found at least in part uh, in the experience of, of tongues. Um, but yeah, I, again, I want to argue that I think the Reformation actually has a rather sacramental understanding of the word. Uh, and we like yeah. to push both Calvin and Luther on admitting that that's part of what's going on there. But yeah. we've got no, but not much time and a few questions left. Yeah, so we're approaching our, our uh, hour. So we'll take one more question from the floor here. Yes. But there's snacks to be had after, so yeah, we can yeah. harass us later. Sure. <laughs> 
Well, there's that's a long history indeed, isn't it? Uh, I mean, certainly um, one of the things you, you, you know you got in, in in the history of the sort of late medieval to early Reformation era is this strident anti-Catholicism, anti-clericalism in part, just against the clergy, but then eventually also against the teachings of the church uh, as a whole, and and that sharp divide uh, existed really up to the 20th century. And it's really only, part of it has been the common experiences of modernity between Catholics and Protestants. We've, we've all been subject to the impact of the Enlightenment and its rationalism and, and secularism and that kind of thing. And that kind of makes, gives us more in common than we had before. But then also you have to recognize the changes from the Second Vatican Council, I think, and the new openness to recognize that there could be Christians outside of the Catholic Church. And that's opened all kinds of doors for productive um, cooperation, at least in some parts of the world. That, that's a very geographically dependent question as well, um, certainly. So it, it uh, yeah, but there's a, quite a long history to that for sure. So our time is up. Um, something we never got to was really talking about how today might be ripe conditions for uh, reformation type oh. circumstance so maybe in closing if either of you could just uh, uh, respond to that and what in what ways may there be contextual factors that are ripe uh, and uh, corrective needs within the church that would call for reformation I think my response to that frankly, would, would be that there's always a process of ongoing reform. And, and there are regularly, um, I think, calls to rethink what we're doing in the church um, based on what's going around, on around us in the world. Yeah. So if you think about the Canadian context, I would say it's from the, from the developments from the late 60s through the 70s and into the Charter of Rights in 1980, raised all kinds of questions uh, with the uncoupling of morality and law that has created this new secular environment in Canada. And that challenges us in so many ways. So there's, there, there, you know, that's just one example of, of something that would, I think, call for a, a need of, of rethinking. But I, but I think in this context, the Reformation, as we celebrate these 500 years, I mean, there's so many questions that are raised uh, by this, questions of the priesthood of believers and, and whether we are running too professional a kind of church today. That would be to me a live question for many of us. We just both, and, and, and Bernie and I were talking about this, both the lay people and the, the, the pastors seem to be content with the professionalization of ministry and just staffing up when there's new needs. That really runs counter to the priesthood of all believers. So that to me is a problem. Mm -hmm. um, the role of the word in terms of biblical literacy. Many of us complain about a lack of biblical literacy um, a lack of literacy in general as well. But what does it mean to be the people of the book in an age of apps and devices? What does that do to mitigate against deep study, deep reading, contextual reading, and so on? So I think there's really con serious questions to be asked around the role of the Bible today. And then even something like the issue of convictions for us. You know, we all love Martin Luther. Here I stand, I can do no other. But what are the hills we really should die on? I mean, what are the, the convictions that are worth becoming bothersome over? Yeah. And what does that mean in an age that values tolerance, plurality, pl pluralism, and so, on, so much? That, that is another call, I think, for a reformation, for a rethinking yeah. um, of the implications of these developments that are going on around us. Yeah. And certainly one of the conditions back then, as you mentioned, was the Gutenberg Press. So the proliferation of ideas rapidly and cheaply. Yeah. Uh, the digital revolution is a contextual factor that I think is going to have huge ramifications upon the church. The other is, is that the, uh, uh, the gravity of thought is moving towards the south. And so different world views are opening God's word and speaking uh, uh, about God's word from uh, rather than a kind of a, a guilt justice orientation that we maybe have with a Western mindset, more to a, um, a shame, honor, Asian mindset, or a fear um, uh, mindset, fear and power mindset of, of the Africas, and yet... Mystic versus natural. 
there's, there's, there's a big difference of how we're going to look through the scriptures through the global south. And the global south is actually much larger than the, the north church now. So 100 years ago, 29% of the believers in the world were in the uh, north of the equator. Uh, or, sorry, 29, 29% of all the world were Christians. Dominantly, it was north of the equator. Now it's 100 years later. It's the same percentage, about 30% of the globe would say I follow Christ, but uh, the lion's share of Christ followers are now in the global south. I think that's going to have a massive effect. Just because I have to throw one more Latin phrase, uh, the thing I think we've left behind from the Reformation has been the motto, which was reformata, semper reformanda, reformed, but always reforming. And I think one of the problems we have to alleviate ourselves of is that there are, we can't talk about stuff anymore. The deal's been done, uh, the die's been cast, uh, the decisions have been made, uh, but we need, to, we need to discuss these things, and we need to constantly be sharpening, sharpening all areas uh, in response to the Word and, and, and these other things. So that, that the Reformation should never be over. We should always be exploring. reforming. Yeah, exploring. Well, very good. So just want to close with a few announcements. Uh, first of all, thank you, everybody, for coming and those that have been uh, with us online. We're so grateful for this opportunity to be together for a couple of hours here tonight. Uh, we do have the Alliance District Conference coming up, and if you hadn't heard about it before this, uh, this evening, we'd invite you to come to that. It will be here at Ambrose on uh, May 5, and then switches over to Southview Alliance for May 6. So it's an evening and a day. And you are welcome to go online on the uh, Western Canadian District website and join in to be part of that. Uh, there is a book cart here. If you would like to look at the books, uh, purchase a book, just pick it up and take it down to the bookstore, and they would like to uh, charge you money for that book. Indulgences. Uh, I'm we don't promise easy. salvation, though. No. Yeah. Just enlightenment. <laughs> I want to end with some of your comments on the Reformation Tour that's coming up. What are you going to do, and uh, how do you get to be a part of that? The easiest way to find out about the Reformation Tour that Bernie and I are, have planned for this summer, for uh, later July into August, is to go to www.ambrose.edu slash reformation, and you can see information there about it. We have plans to uh, see the Luther sites and then move on down into Switzerland. Uh, and see the Zwinglian and Calvinist Reformation as well. And we would love to have you come along with us, and uh, you can certainly talk to either of us for more information about that. So you have a trip in May? We have a trip in May with, I have a trip in May with some students. Uh, others are welcome to come, although that's getting harder to book into now. But if you're interested, please talk to me. I'll, I'll certainly do what I can. And then the, the main trip in the summer in July and August. Fantastic. Yep. I have been. I've been with these guys. It is a tremendous uh, learning experience, a great cultural experience, and fantastic. We also have um, a four-part Reformation speaker series coming up. What, what's the deal on that? In the fall, um, to celebrate the 500th anniversary of the Reformation, um, some uh, academics from the University of Calgary, Mount Royal, St. Mary's, and uh, here from Ambrose, we've been planning a four-part uh, uh, lecture series um, that will happen throughout the fall. Um, we don't have the final dates and speakers quite nailed down yet. Um, Robert Kolb is coming uh, to the University of Calgary. He's a well-known Reformation scholar, and we've got others coming as well. So you can keep an eye out for that, and we'll certainly be publicizing that through Ambrose as well in the coming months. Excellent. Well, thanks again, friends, and let's thank our two uh, professors here tonight for their time and for their direction.